uh, can we introduce to the stage um, a multi-talented man, writer, actor, direction? Have you done direction? Yeah, a bit of that, a bit of that. I'm probably not, he's probably a very good cook as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you'll recognise him with a bronze dome. <laughs> not that dome, but <laughs> a bronze dome with uh, an eye salt and, well, you know who he is anyway. Mr. Nicholas Pegg. So you've had eight coffees now. Um, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> You're ready to go. Oh, yes. um, before we kick off with the Daleks, um, I think you ought to tell people that you know this place quite well. Yeah, I do actually. Um, not this specific room, uh, but yes, back in the late Triassic period, I was a student at Exeter University. Uh, so this is like coming back to the old, uh, the old uh, barracks for me. And uh, I see you've got an amazing new thing with a roof over there, which uh, I shall enjoy going and having a look at a little bit later on. Um, I, I gather that's where the pub is as well, uh, Simon. So <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I read English here in um, <coughs> June 86, is when I first came here. Uh, so you can all look at how old I am there. Uh, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and I can remember, you know, watching Doctor Who in the common room at Heatherington House, which has now been demolished. Um, but uh, is there a new kind of Durian Hall of or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in the old one before they called it down. And quite right, too. You should have seen this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Trial of a Time Lord was on that autumn for the first time. And that's what we sat there watching in the common room. Mm, happy days. So happy anyway, day. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> 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 <That's laughs> We're just going to be quiet now for the next hour. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Dalek. Dalek. You are a Dalek. We're going to yeah. head straight into it. Um, everybody knows this. So, how did you originally get the job being cast as somebody inside a Dalek? Well, uh, it actually goes back further than you might think because uh, the first time that I got inside a Dalek and, and did it was actually <laughs> 20 years ago. Um, after I was at... Um, a student here. I then went to drama school and did a postgraduate course there and, and graduated and, and, you know, became an actor. Because normally I play human beings, you know, I, 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 a Dalek is a kind of slightly peculiar uh, <laughs> line on my CV, but a, but a very, very <laughs> enjoyable one. Um, and 20 years ago, it would not take a mathematical genius to work out, it was the 30th anniversary of Doctor Who. And the BBC made a documentary called 30 Years in the TARDIS, which, as well as all the interviews and things that you'd expect in the documentary, there were also various sort of um, reconstructions of famous old scenes from Doctor Who, like the Cybermen coming down the steps in front of St Paul's Cathedral and the Daleks uh, going over Westminster Bridge and this sort of thing. And, uh, as I say, I had just not recently, not recently, not, not, not long, got out of drama school at the time. And I knew the guy who was uh, directing this show, a guy called Kevin Davis, and he just gave me a ring one day and, and said, uh, I was actually a Cyberman first. He said, do you want to be a Cyberman coming down the steps in front of St. Paul's Cathedral because we're looking for people to do this? And I said, yeah, thanks very much. I certainly would, you know, before he got a chance to change his mind. Uh, so we went and shot that at um, something like five o'clock on a Sunday morning at some point outside St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, and I was the cyber leader. That was very exciting. I remember we were... We took ages rehearsing it before we actually did the shot because those step, there wasn't just a set of steps going down. It was like step, 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 and then a flat bit, and then step, step, step and then another flat, and so on and so on. And once you're inside one of those old, it was a lot of 1980s type Cybermen, uh, you can't see a damn thing out of those things because the, 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 these do eye holes and they're quite far forward away from you. So you basically you have got tunnel vision. You can do that, but you can't see anything down there, you know, immediately in front of you. So before they put the heads on, we practice it over and over again, walking down the step without looking down because obviously Cybermen have got to look a bit. <laughs> uh, so we rehearsed it over and over again, and that's why the other thing is, because the light shone through these eye pieces, they painted black uh, makeup around our eyes, so we looked like sort of pandas. So we were rehearsing this over and over and over again on this Sunday morning, and it, got, it was getting later and later, and the traffic was gradually building up, and I remember this lady driving past into the road, going along the bottom of these steps, you see, uh, driving past in the car and seeing it all coming down in our side and things, but without our heads on it, just kind of going... <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm waffling madly because what happened then was about a week later, Kevin phoned up and said, Right, now we're doing 
Daleks on Westminster Bridge. Do you want to come and be a Dalek? So I said, yes, please. And uh, so we did this shot of the Daleks going over Westminster Bridge with Big Ben in the background. And uh, that was the point, by the way, at which Kevin said, we need loads of Daleks. Do you want to recommend anyone else? And I said, yeah, what about my best friend Barnaby Edwards, who I was at drama school with? Uh, so he came along as well, and that was the first time that Barnaby, who I'm sure you know as well, is, is, is one of the Dalek operators, got to do it. And ever since then, basically, I think we were marked men. You know, our names were on a piece of paper in a filing cabinet somewhere at the BBC saying, these people do Daleks. So when the new series came round in 2004-2005, uh, someone opened that filing cabinet and said, right, who's, who's in here who's, who isn't dead yet? Uh, <laughs> 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 who could be a Dalek? And, and of course, Nick Briggs, who we both knew very well as well, was already on board to do the Dalek voices, and he put in a word for us and said, oh yeah, they can, they can do it. Uh, so we got the call, and ever since then we've been, uh, and been Daleking. It was Barnaby first, wasn't it? In the first episode, Dalek, which obviously only had the one Dalek, yeah, yeah Barnaby did that one, and then, and then it came on for, um, for, for Bad Wolf and so forth, and ever since then. So, obviously, he'd, he'd been in the new gold Dalek, yeah, and you'd been in the older Daleks, yeah, and then when you all got together and did the, the new gold Daleks at the end of the series, was that any different to the older Daleks? I mean, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's the same, you know, it's exactly the same as they ever used to be, really. They're slightly chunkier and, and, and more sort of um, sturdy these days than the old ones. Uh, but basically, it's exactly the same as they ever used to be. There's a hole in the bottom, there's three sort of supermarket trolley casters, one, one at the front and two at the back sort of thing. And they're about as reliable, you know, when you're trying to steer a supermarket trolley around, it can be a little bit like that sometimes if you get a dodgy one. Uh, and, um, and, you know, there's a handle to control the gun and another one to control the um, sink plunger. And, uh, and, I mean, the big difference, of course, now, which I don't really may know, is that some, but not all, of the new Daleks have remote-controlled heads. So there's a guy uh, standing over there somewhere behind the camera, spinning it around and making the eye go up and down. There's, not, there's only a couple like that. We often use manual ones as well, um, which... You know, there's just a thing hanging down, a stick hanging down that you rotate it with and, and pull it up and down to make the ice door go up and down. So you need three hands, really, to do mm. those ones with. So we do actually quite like the manual ones, though. They're, they're kind of fun. You feel slightly more in control of your own Dalek. I was, going to, I was going to say, with the ice talk moving up and down remotely and you're moving around to somebody else's words, yeah. I mean, how difficult is that? It can actually be. I mean, we've got... Barney and I have got really used to working with Colin and Lynn, who are the two guys with the remote controls. You know, we've, we've kind of become second nature to us now after, after eight years or whatever it is. But when it started, it was quite hard, actually, because, you know, we try and do this thing. Um, we do have a whole kind of philosophy. We have a whole philosophy of the Dalek movement. That sounds so ridiculous. But no, we, we have a kind of system that, you know, whereby, for example, if I'm a Dalek and I'm facing you and I'm going to go over there, uh, we do this thing where the Dalek looks over there first and then its body goes round while the eye stays there, and then you go off like that. And obviously if someone else is turning their head, that's fine for the first bit, but then they have to turn it back at the same speed that you're turning the body, you know, and, and, mm. and if someone else is doing that, it's quite hard. And to start off with, before we got into the swing of it, you know, we'd often, you know, that would be lovely, and then I'd turn around, and that one would go, woo, over there somewhere, and it would look really rubbish, you know. Um, or, or, you know, I'm not just blaming the other guys, I, I could do it rubbish as well. Uh, but, you know, we got, we got quite into it, yeah, but that's one of the reasons, and we, we, you know, it's kind of easier to, to operate the manual ones in some respects, because mm. you're in control of all of that yourself. Of course, it's not easier in other respects, because you've got more things to do. Mm. So, yeah. as, far as, the, as far as the process, when you approach an episode, m other actors will get their script, obviously, because they have lines. Do you get a full script? Oh, yeah, 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 we get the script, um, you know, same, same as everyone else. I mean, some of the monsters, a lot of the monsters on Doctor Who are played by um, SAEs, as we say, supporting artists, or extras, the other... You know, the, um, some of them, uh, however, are not. And Barnaby and I are, you know, uh, not sound grand about it, but we are actors. We're not essays, uh, and you know, normally we, we, we play parts with, with lines and everything. And the reason that they hire actors rather than actors to play the two sort of principal Daleks is, is that it, you do have to rehearse it. There is actually a, you know, sounds a little bit silly because obviously compared to you know doing Shakespeare or something, it's not that kind of an acting performance. But you do have to. We have to learn the lines because we, although Nick Briggs is doing the voices for us, we have to sort of animate the dialect in time to the lines, so we have to know what's coming up and all that. And we rehearse it with the other actors, you know, before we get into our dialects. We all stand around in, on the set and in the right position and kind of, you know, Barnaby and I will actually usually stand there sort of going <laughs> like that. Because, you know, the, the director, when, when you're rehearsing a scene before shooting it, and I'm sure Saul will tell you more about this later on, 
the director will, will want to walk around and just position people and just, you know, while you're reading through the scene, you might just come out and see. Just go there. That's your position. And, and so we'll, we'll be there for that reason, you know, before we get in. And also, it's much quicker to get the results that you need if we're out of our dialect to start with, because once you're inside, it becomes the whole, you know, the nuances of communication between director and dialect become a little bit more uh, complicated once you're locked up inside that thing, and, and all the people can do is just shout at you. Then. I was going to say, well, how do the directors cope with the dialects? Oh, nightmare. They're awful, these directors. No, 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 it's great. I mean, uh, no, I mean, the hard thing, I guess, for, well, not just for the directors, but everybody, that once we're all inside, and once we've all glided about a bit, Nobody can tell which one's me and which one's Barnaby and which one's uh, Dad or, or whatever, you know, of course, because we all look like darlings. So there's a constant thing of sort of, who's that in there? Uh, Nick? All oh, right, Nick, we need you to move over here a bit. And, and this sort of goes on. So again, which is another good reason why, uh, why, why we rehearse out of them to start with. Because obviously it's quicker for everyone. It's quicker for the director if, if he or she can say, you know, uh, Barnaby, I need you to go over there rather than, who's that darling? What are you doing? Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's... Um, it's, it's a peculiar one, you know, being a I, I did play an otter once, so, um, so, so it might not be the weirdest thing I've ever done. An otter? An otter, yeah. Not a badger. I don't think I've ever played a badger. <laughs> I, well, the show I was in was, with, was an otter, was Wind in the Willow, so it did have a badger in it. So um, that's the nearest probably I've got to a, to a badger anecdote from a friend. What about any other anecdotes with the Daleks? I mean, do you ha the anecdote of the Daleks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the episode of the next season. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Anecdote. Of the Daleks. Um, any any accidents on set? Anything funny? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's all just probably big accident. <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, of course it isn't. Um, oh yeah, I mean, kind of crazy things just happen all the time because it's a crazy show. I mean, you know, there's a massive, massive team of people who are brilliant who work together to bring Doctor Who to the screen, you know. I mean, you see on screen, you know, Matt and, and Jenna and the monsters and the other actors and everything. Obviously, you're aware that there's a lighting designer and a set designer and a director. But the, the actual number of people involved is just phenomenal when you get down to all the people whose job it is to do props and whose job it is to do the thing. So, and, and it can be quite, you know, crazy things happen every day because it's such a complicated show. I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky making any show. It's tricky making EastEnders, you know, but, but making a show like Doctor Who, where everything is sort of bespoke and strange, and it, you know, it doesn't, it, it needs to look like a spaceship. It doesn't need to look like a, you know, an ordinary suburban house or something, mm. or a street or whatever. It just makes it that bit more complicated. So yeah, silly things happen all the time. I'm trying to think of an example. There's so many that I, because uh, you know, as I said, this huge team of people are there to descend upon the thing and, and make everything okay if anything does go wrong, and they're brilliant. Oh, of course, I just thought of one which is quite good. When we were doing the first, um, the Christopher Eccleston series, the Bad Wolf story, um, I don't know how familiar you are with that particular one, but in that one, the Daleks invade this space station, which had appeared earlier in the same season, a few episodes earlier in, in, um, in the, uh, the Long Game. And of course, that set had been built for the Long Game. And so we're rehearsing on this set, you know, before we started shooting. And the point came at which the director of that one, Joe Hearn, said, obviously, these are the doors that you're going to be coming in through. Now. At which point, we kind of start looking at these doors. There's some big main set of the space station. And, and we started looking at the Daleks and looking at the organ going... <coughs> and, and so someone got a tape measure out, and sure enough it turned out that the base of the Daleks, which is the widest bit, obviously, was actually about four inches wider than the base of the, of, of, of the door. So it was absolutely physically impossible to get through them. Uh, so this space station was completely impervious to Dalek attack at this point. <laughs> 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 We pointed it out politely to the uh, to the uh, second AD who was sort of showing us around and things. And he got hold of the standby props team who are brilliant. And, you know, we all went off to lunch. And by the time we got back from lunch, all these doors, which before lunch had been shaped kind of just like normal doorways, were suddenly sort of shaped like this instead. Um, and lo and behold, the... Uh, spaceship was ready for Dalek occupation, but there's these brilliant teams of people who will just come in and they, you know, it wasn't just that they saw a bit off, they then, they then got a load of battening and put little sort of reveals on them so they looked 3D and then they painted them and they did all this. But yeah, you know, however hard you um, uh, try and prepare everything beforehand, there's always going to be funny, unpredictable, weird things going on. I just thought of another one, sorry, tell me to shut up. Shall I do another one? Yes. Uh, in <laughs> in um, Doomsday, you may recall, we... Uh, sucked the brains out of a poor scientist at one point. Um, I forget the name of the character, but the actor was called Raji, I remember. Uh, and do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, I, was in, I was in the black Dalek 
for that one. Very exciting. Uh, and you will recall we all kind of extended our plungers towards him, and, and then it kind of all went a bit CG. And then when we pulled them back, this horrible, emaciated, dead body thing had ever fell on the floor. Now that was done. The first bit was done before lunch, and then we went off and had lunch. And the second bit with the dummy falling on the floor was done after lunch. And in between, the actor, the guy who was playing uh, this character, actually, that was the end of his shooting, so we had to go home. He was, you know, he was catching the train at lunchtime. He was gone by the time we did the bit with the dummy. Okay. Now, you may recall, uh, if you remember the episode extremely well, that this character wore glasses. And uh, some, the glasses that he wore in the uh, episode were his own glasses. This, this guy, the actor, did actually wear glasses, and they were his own glasses. And suddenly, they realised, because they wanted to put these glasses on the dummy, you know, because obviously he'd be wearing his glasses, so, but he was going to go, he was catching the train, he was going, and he was taking his glasses with him, obviously, because they were his. And, uh, and so there was this sort of five minute, oh my god, we need a pair of glasses, what can we do? And then, and then he said, well, why don't I just take them off, just before you kill me? And uh, so if you watch that episode, you will see that as he bravely strides up to the Daleks, he sort of goes and takes his glasses off for absolutely no reason except that <laughs> he was on the train on the way home by the time we pulled our plugs away and his dead body with no glasses fell off. So, you know, perfectly good solution. That's actually just reminded me of another even more silly one. Should I get another? Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm making it sound like everything's a cock-up. Of course it is. It's a tiny little piece of Most of the time it's a well-oiled machine and everyone knows what they're doing.